Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the live show. Woo! Yeah. 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 Woo! Live show. Live, live show. show. Live show. That's a good one. Uh, I'm Carmel McDonald. And I am, as ever, Tim Maynard. Always. And I'm Courtney Cruz. And Courtney, today is a special day, everybody. It is. Tell us what today is. I'm turning 30. Woo! Yeah! And I am my parents' baby. So that just, if I think I'm getting old, it just means they're old. Because <laughs> I'm the youngest. Aww. Yeah, that is a sweet way to put it. Okay. It is adorable. And I can still tell my sister that she's old because she's older than me. How much older, though? Five years. Okay, that is quite so, a bit older. What are you going to yeah. do today to celebrate? Who? Well, we enjoyed the Ella Sharp Beer and Wine Fest yesterday, and today we'll probably just be hanging out. Cool. We did take a trip in May to celebrate, so that was kind of cool. Awesome. Awesome. So, I don't know if you guys remember, I certainly do, because mm -hmm. I have memory like a steel trap. <laughs> yes, you do. And we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, last week we talked about apocalyptic worship. 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 Thank you. I was going to say apocalyptic <laughs> literature. Or something like that, but that's that's next it? week. That's yeah. That's, <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, that's all those books you have out of the dumpsters about zombies. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of dumpster diving going on. But I think Dave <laughs> actually talked about some things too. And if you guys want a refresher, we got a quick thirty seconds for you. Let's check it out. The potential you can't do anything with what you, what you can work with. Is what you're actually doing, who, who you're actually becoming, the, the, the effort, the industry, the energy, the, the passion, the, the nobility, the, the verve, that, that's what we can work with. That's what God works with when we sing. We've now given him something to play with, us, our lives, our ambitions, our hopes, our dreams, and, and now he can turn it into something else. Oh my goodness, that was an amazing recall video. That guy's awesome. Yes, <laughs> very good. And whoever edited that, such a good job. Um, very well done. So what we wanted to talk about, what I wanted to talk about today, was the adventure of the Christian life as it pertains to horrible dates. <laughs> and we've all been on horrible dates. For some of us, it's been many, many years since yes. we've been on a horrible date. Some of us went on a horrible date last week. This guy. No. But, uh, <laughs> oh, no. It happens sometimes. The old foot goes in the mouth. You know? <laughs> Trying to give a compliment turns out bad. But, so, <laughs> you know, who would have thought that my mouth would get me in trouble? It but, seems like not my <laughs> type of thing. Uh, but, so here's my question for you, Carmel. Got it. Can you tell us the most adventurous, in a positive way maybe, the most adventurous date you've ever been on? Yes. Uh, actually... I went on a date where the guy tricked me into going out with him. He asked a whole group of people, and then they didn't show, and it was just him. And then um, the place where I was staying at the time, the, I was billeting, you know, where you just kind of stay with people because you're from out of town, and they had a, one of those bicycles built for two, and we oh, hopped on and rode all over the town for the entire night. It was super fun. Yeah, it was wow. good. Mm -hmm. cool. It was Dave. Oh. oh! And then it brings it all together. Then, at the end. So Dave is a trickster. <clears throat> what you're saying? Yeah, it almost didn't work. He had a red Camaro with black spray paint on the side, and he was a pastor, and he was shorter than me. <laughs> <laughs> so it almost did not happen. But yeah. the two seater bike, it, it clinched it. Nice. Yeah. That's a classic romantic move. The two seater mm -hmm. bike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're all out of time, unfortunately. Courtney, I did want to hear about your day, but. Next time, folks, <laughs> tune in for the next show to hear about Courtney's experiences uh, going on a date with her, maybe husband, maybe someone else. I don't know. Uh, I forget what I we're throwing it to. It's Heidi on the street. She... <laughs> <laughs> she's going to ask people there. about their dates. <laughs> she's going to ask people about their dates, hopefully, maybe uh, awkwardly, yeah. maybe smoothly. We'll see. <laughs> Let's throw it to Heidi. It's time for Heidi on the street. Hey, Heidi's back on the street, except this time I had to stop for a cool, refreshing beverage, and we ran into this, a fine, attractive gentleman. His name is? David. His name is David. Okay, David, just two quick questions. You ready? Yes. Okay. Who is your most inspirational person in your life outside of your family? Honestly, it's God. I like the answer, but I can just answer. Can I ask you why? 
not that I'm that religious a person, but I always think it's an inspiration to talk to him every day. That's awesome. Nice. I think it's a great answer. Awesome. Okay, uh, second question, last question. So far, you're doing good. Not nervous. <laughs> Double jeopardy. Not, not nervous. <laughs> no risk at all. How can I be nervous with Heidi? Yeah, see? I don't even know. I'm good. We're going to have to have a, a lemonade together. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Arnie Palmer's. Oh, okay. It's a little bit too much sweet. No, no. You go with the iced tea. With the, uh, you got a lemonade. You do the yeah. iced tea on sweet. Okay. I'm going to do that after. Half this. and half. Look how much I learn on the street. Oh, cool. I, I know. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm getting distracted by the honor of Palmer. All right, so you, the last question. What would be your dream retirement? Ask me, Colorado. Are you a skier? Absolutely. And uh, I also am a biker. So that particular area would be fun, I think, to retire in. Very expensive. Actually, I could hang out any place in Colorado. It would probably be pretty good anyway. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's another segment of Heidi on the street. And that's when the cops got. My, uh, my, my turn up. Bring it. Bring it on. Come on. Welcome. Program. Hello, hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. How are you doing? Welcome to the live show, the West Coast Live Show, June 5th, 2016. Thank you for grounding us in reality. That is the date. I'm Tim Maynard. <laughs> and I am Tyler Chase. I'm a, a husband of the past 14 years. I have three kids. <laughs> what are we doing? And I enjoy long walks on the beach. <laughs> this isn't Christian Mingle. <laughs> oh, okay. That's my, other, that's my other YouTube account. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. What do we have to talk about, Tyler? We have lots of things to talk about. Rebels Hope is good. I can hear the music right now. I can't I can't get enough of it. Yeah, you've been listening to it in the car. Yeah, like nonstop. I think my wife is starting to get perturbed. Sure. You know. Sure. It's good stuff, though. Um, also, speaking of Rebels Hope, they have a lot of, how do you call it? Ge not gear. Uh, swag. Swag. They call it yeah. swag. That's the technical term. Very technical. Mm -hmm. um, Rebels Hope swag. So they have these, like those cards. What are they? Coasters? They're not coasters. I like I to call them coasters. Be yeah, I wouldn't set anything on them. But they're like, they have uh, a little phrase and then an explanation of the phrase. If you want to uh, have a conversation starter for your family. Yeah. Uh, or maybe you have that special someone in your life. That you're trying to get more spiritually close to. Yeah. You're trying to, you know. Yeah, maybe this is a good conversation starter. So when we, we, I bought it last week, and I really didn't understand the, the premise of it before, like mm. after we got it. So, like, I read the, the little quote or whatever, and then we went through the description. Yeah. And it's not, there's no question. Oh, okay. It just says, what is God teaching you about worship through this little card? Yeah. So you read the description, and it was kind of hard to, like, just, oh, since we didn't know, it was kind of a weird yeah. conversation, but it did yeah. spur some good, um, good points that I think both of us had and we didn't really think about before. So, cool. Check it out. Check out the Westwinds Rebels Hope swag. But now, we're gonna check out with Dave. Peace. They're already there. Talk about stories every Christian ought to know. Now, if you're here and you're going, well, I don't know that I'm really a Christian yet. I'm not sure where I am with God. That's okay. These are probably good stories for you to know too. If for no other reason that then you can tease your Christian friends that you know more about their religion than they do. So we've got uh, about half these stories are from the Bible and about half these stories are from the long history of Christian tradition at those key moments where Christians made good decisions or galvanized together and took good action. And that, that this really defined how our faith ought to be lived out. But today we're going to start in the book of Exodus. The first and perhaps most important story, I think, in the entire Old Testament is the story of God's rescue of his people from Egyptian captivity. And if you've never heard this story before, if you've never seen the movie with Charlton Heston or the terrible movie by Ridley Scott, or if you've never seen the uh, little cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, you know, th th this is the story of how God liberated his people after almost 500 years of captivity. So, so let me rewind the clock and show you how they got there. At the end of the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, God's people are, are, are captured. And for 430 years, they're enslaved by the Egyptians to make bricks. Men, women, any child over the age of about five or six, they were charged seven days a week with going and grabbing one clump of mud from this pool over here 
to over to this pool over here and smearing that mud into these huge sort of baking clays, leaving the bricks out in the sun to dry. Then when they were done, they would take the bricks and use them to build, you know, these, these huge and enduring works of architectural wonder. Well, as you can imagine, that sucked. Like, that sucked times a hundred. Nobody wants to make bricks for a week, let alone 430 years. And over and over and over again, God's people call out and they complain. They beg for help and they don't get it. Now, some of you may have a difficult time conceptualizing 430 years. Um, like, say, all of us. I have never waited 430 years for anything. You, this, this sermon might feel like it's 430 minutes long. Even that is going to pale in comparison to the sense of anticipation of desperation that they had. And lo and behold, at one point, the Hebrew people became so numerous, so bunny rabbit-like in their ability to reproduce, that Pharaoh said, that's it, we're done. Anybody under the age of two will be killed. And so there was one woman in particular who had a nice young son named Moses, who was just an infant, and she took him and did what all good mothers do. She put him in a basket and sailed him down the river. <laughs> and, and so as she sends Moses away through some strange twist of providence, it's Pharaoh's own daughter that finds the baby Moses, rescues him from out of the river, and then turns around and asks Moses' biological mom, to be his nursemaid. So Moses grows up in the household of Pharaoh as an Israelite. And, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that from the beginning, Moses is a character in deep conflict, right? He, he would have felt like a betrayer, like a turncoat, because he knows he's Israeli. He knows his biological mom is Israeli. You, you can tell by the way that you look at him, by, by the way that he acts, by, by some of his features. And, and yet he's growing up as a slave living off the benefits of slavery. So inside of himself, he's got this weird, almost soul sickness that manifests when he's an adult. And he sees, perhaps you remember the story, one of the Israeli slaves being mistreated by an Egyptian. And he interferes and then murders the Egyptian. And expecting gratitude from the Israeli, instead he gets scorn. And then Moses runs away. In fact, he runs away to the land of Midian and spends almost 40 years hiding in cowardice. Now, again, I told you Moses is a character in conflict, right? He's in ethnic conflict as a Jew growing up in an Egyptian household. He, he's in a kind of social conflict because his people were denied education, and yet as a member of Pharaoh's household, he would have been given the best education, the best privileges, the best rank. Then, then he's in a kind of religious conflict because when he goes to Midian, he marries the daughter of a priest. Now, any of you ever read uh, the Old Testament, right? You know, all those uh, things that God says about other gods, aren't they nice? Like where he says, Baal, he's so cool. If I'm busy, just call him, right? There's all those really ni nice, tender things that God says about other gods. No, always, all the way through the Bible, God's totally intolerant of Baal, Ashtra, Marduk. I mean, the, all the other gods he's supremely ticked off at. So isn't it weird that when Moses goes to Midian, he grows up in the household of a priest of another religion? He's in social conflict, he's in ethnic conflict, he's in religious conflict. I mean, he's a deeply divided person. And then he has this mystical experience where God speaks to him and tells him, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to confront your former family on behalf of your true family and say to the Pharaoh, who would have been like his half-brother, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? Suck it. Yeah, I think loosely translated. There's no way. And then we begin this huge, crazy adventure where, where Moses begins to perform miraculous signs and Pharaoh refuses to listen to them or take any kind of heed or warning. And then Moses promises plagues on behalf of God. And this is really the, the big part of the story is the 10 plagues that God sends through Moses against Pharaoh. And uh, for probably the last at least 20 years, but, but maybe a little longer, maybe 30 years, scientists have been trying to put together how these plagues would have worked together. And even though some of this is speculative, I, I find it really interesting. So this is a, a historical reconstruction of how, how these 10 plagues would have gone. And it begins, of course, with the first plague, which is God promising that he will turn the River Nile to blood. Do we have that slide, Jake? So this is a picture of the River Nile t t today. That's why there's, you know, boats and <laughs> concrete and all the good stuff, you know, telephone poles, right? So this is the River Nile today, and, and it's full of, of a red algae bloom, which makes it look, at least on that screen, it makes it look deeply blood red. And, and scientists figure this was really the catalytic event 
of the 10 plagues of Egypt is God sponsoring this algae bloom, which then kills off all kinds of fish and dries up all sorts of nutrients in, or, or, or depletes all sorts of nutrients in the river. And, and one of the effects that it has is actually plague number two, is that it pushes all the amphibious life, all, all the crocodiles and specifically all the frogs out onto the land. The second plague, the plague of frogs, was a major nuisance to the Egyptians. They got frogs in their cornflakes, frogs in their makeup kit, frogs in their handbag, you know, everything just goes over. And, and the pr proliferation of frogs actually invites a particular kind of gnat, which I cannot say correctly, but I'll try, and you won't know the difference anyway, but a, a culiocoitus gnat. Thank you. I'm here all week, right? The culiocoitus gnat, which, which shows up. And, and this thing is, is uh, attracted to the bodies of dead fish and dead frogs, and, and the more time it spends with them, the more those gnats bring swarms of inflect, insects. This is the next... Uh, plague and, and it's a kind of stable fly they're called and, and they they happen around the banks of the river and the flies get all over the food and then of course the flies transmit this disease sometimes called blue tongue it's an African horse sickness and that kills all of the livestock and then because now you've got flies and gnats and dead livestock then all of a sudden the people break out in boils which are bites from the culiocoitus gnat you have a nice picture of boils it feels like my family vacation photos really every vacation i've ever taken <laughs> looks roughly like this right now at this point there's a slight detour from the chain of causation right the algae sends out the frogs the frogs bring the gnats the gnats bring the culiocoitus, or, or they, they kill the livestock and the boils. But, th but then there's this one that doesn't quite fit, and it's the plague of hail. And, and I think this is a good reminder for us that these plagues have a, a supernatural sponsorship, that God is demonstrating his power to the Egyptians, saying 430 years is long enough to oppress an entire group of people. And then we go back and we have a plague of locusts is the next plague. Now, plagues of locusts or swarms of locusts are really common in Africa, particularly in the Middle East, um, but they need certain conditions to thrive. And, and those conditions are the ones that would have been, again, caused by you know the, the, all the overflowing of the Red Sea and the dead fish, etc. And then from there, we get the plague of darkness, where these huge sandstorms would have come in, you know, 18 or 20 stories tall, sandstorm called a, a Kadzin. They still have these. Um, that was in that movie Sahara with Matthew McConaughey. If you're a lady, you know that movie. Don't, I mean, it's the one where he takes off his shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Also known as every Matthew McConaughey movie, right? So, so you know, they just come in and the, this huge sandstorm comes in, covers the sun and the sky, and, and you get this, this massive oppressive darkness. Now, those are the first nine plagues. And Moses warns Pharaoh, he says, time after time after time, you've got to let my people go. Your oppression of God's people must end. And Pharaoh says, no. Slaves are a huge part of our economy. Slaves are a huge part of the way our country works. We are not letting them go. And this is what God says to Moses. He says, go one more time to Pharaoh and tell him that I will strike the land of Egypt and after this, Pharaoh will urge you. He will beg you to leave the country. In fact, he will force you. So Moses announces to Pharaoh at midnight tonight, I, the Lord your God, will pass through the heart of Egypt. And all the firstborn sons in every family will die. From the oldest son of Pharaoh to the oldest son of the lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all livestock will die, and then a loud wail will rise throughout the land, a wail like no one has ever heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark, and then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between his people and those who oppress his people. And then God goes on to give instructions to the Israelites. And he says, every family among you must choose a lamb, or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal per household. And if a family is too small to eat the whole animal, then share with another family in the neighborhood and divide that animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. And then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at, at twilight. And they're to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of their houses. And that same night, they've got to roast the meat over a fire and eat it with bitter salad and bread made without yeast. Now, don't eat any of the meat raw or boiled. The whole animal must be roasted over a fire. Don't leave any of it until the next morning and burn whatever is left over. Now, that's, that sounds really technical, right? 
Like this could be the least inspiring part of the Bible right here. But, but I want you to, to imagine what God is actually communicating. First, he says, take this lamb into your home. You get little kids? You ever brought a baby anything around little kids? It, it, it could be a baby skunk. And they're, oh, look at how cute. Don't touch that thing. Yeah. Any infant animal immediately creates a bond of attachment. And if you were to bring it into a family household with you know, parents and, and grandparents and little kids and infants, your, your family would grow attached to this animal. Now, in some cases, that animal would have been there. That little baby lamb would have been there for like six weeks. So you're going to feel a strong sense of affiliation to this pet all the while knowing that the time is coming when you must sacrifice it. Now, let's not get too gory. This is not some you know, weird kind of uh, ritual where there's you know, black robes and weird makeup and um, you know, kiss playing in the background. This is, uh, this, this is a meal. And, and note what we're told. We're, we're, don't, don't waste this. If your family's so small that you can't eat the whole thing, well, then share with somebody else. Why? Well, because it's a reminder that this whole thing isn't about you and your kid or you and your husband or boyfriend. Or what. This is about us. This is about the whole neighborhood. This is about the whole you to take what's left over as a sign. And I want you to smear it over the doorpost so, so that everybody knows what team you're on. So, so that everybody knows by whom you have been marked. So everybody, when they walk through your neighborhood, knows to whom you belong. Because this isn't God acting on behalf of one person or two people. This is God acting on behalf of all of his people to rectify a situation that has been wrong for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, the reason I think this is a story everybody ought to know is because it's a framing story, not only for the First Testament, but also for the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is often referred to as the New Moses. Uh, the, the New Covenant is sometimes called you know, the Second Exodus. You and I, like the ancient Israeli people, are struggling to get free of all the crap that's got us in bondage. Maybe those things are addictions. Maybe those are bad or toxic relationships. Maybe, maybe those are stupid ways of thinking. About, but we, like them, are, are struggling for freedom. So when we get to this part, the, the crux of the story, let, let me see if I can teach it to you real, real quick using an acronym. The acronym is DARK, D-A-R-K. It's a common little motif for storytellers. But, but first, the D stands for desire. So what's their desire? The desire is to get free. They don't want to make bricks anymore. They don't want to be treated like crap anymore. And so they take action through the person of Moses. And that action is not only confrontation, but, but also obedience and faithfulness to God. They mark themselves out as God's people. But then R they hit resistance. What's the resistance? Well, this plague of the firstborn happens. Pharaoh, of course, is devastated, and he does just what God said he wanted to do, which is what? Right, chase the people out. Get lost. Take your crap and get out of here. So 600,000 Hebrew people start marching in the middle of the night with whatever they can carry on their backs. And then in the morning, Pharaoh goes, wait a minute, I hate those guys. I'm going to kill them. And he takes his whole army and chases them down, not to recapture his slaves, but to wipe them from the face of the earth. And so Moses leads his people to the edge of the Red Sea. And the scripture tells us that they went through the sea on dry land. And then the Spirit of God parted the waters. Now, I want you to get the order right. They went through the sea on dry land. Which means they didn't stop, look around, then wait for God to show up, part the sea, and okay, kids, come on. No, no. They went, who knows how deep, hip deep, waist deep. They went into the water. Little kids holding on to their daddy's hand, moms with their kids up on their shoulder, everybody terrified. And, and then in the midst of their terror, God created the most spectacular mystery of, or miracle of which we have record. And, and his spirit parted the Red Sea. They walked through on dry ground. And then when the last Hebrew child had got to the far side of the Red Sea and, and, and Pharaoh with all of his chariots and horses and soldiers and spirit were swallowed up in an instant as the two halves of the sea came crashing together. Now, th this, is, this is the kick. This is the end of this episode of that story and the propulsion into the next chapter of God's people. We'll come back to that later on, but I just want you to know that's, that's the end, but it's not the final ending. Now, like them, you and I have a desire. We desire to be free. 
from our loneliness, from our anxiety, from our depression, from our frustration. We want to get free from our old ways of habit. We don't want to date losers anymore. We don't want to hang out with idiots anymore. We don't want to have dead-end jobs anymore. We don't want to think crappy thoughts about ourselves. We want to be free, free from our addictions, free from our challenges. We want a life that's different. But if we're going to have it, we need to take action. And if we look at the Hebrew people, their action can be broken up into two big big categories, both of which start with S because I'm a preacher and that's what we do. We start things with S, okay? Sunday, sanctified, hallelujah. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, two, the two big things are, first of all, that they make a sacrifice and then that they show solidarity. If you want to move forward in your life, if you want to move forward in your relationship with God, you want to move forward in your family, your career, whatever, you, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Sometimes you might even have to sacrifice things you really like, like, like a little lamb. Sometimes you might have to sacrifice things that you've grown quite accustomed to, a certain way of thinking or talking or acting or interacting with other people. Sometimes you might have to sacrifice some relationships that are holding you back. But you're going to have to let go of some things. You might have to excise some things and cut them out in order for you to move forward. Like, you, you ever change a diaper? Sometimes just for fun. That's what I do on Saturdays, you know. Oh, but you know when, when the, you're holding the baby and it's so cute and then it, and then it fills its shorts and your first thought is, where's his mom? <laughs> and then, but then you go, okay, I know I've got to deal with this. Well, what do you do, right? You, you unwrap the diaper, you, you make noise, you know, do, do all this stuff and then you, you clean them up and you use the wipes and you throw it away and then the powder and then you put the, back on the new diaper and then the kid's so happy, right? I mean, it's this whole process. Well, well, you've got to go through that whole process. Because if all you did was open up the diaper, look at the mess, throw some powder on it, and zip them back up, I mean, that, he's not clean. He's going to get all kinds of weird infection and contamination. He's going to be filthy, and you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> That's the most important part. Well, the same kind of thing applies to us spiritually. There's some stuff that you've been through, man, where you messed your shorts. You said some things. You got involved in some circumstances that, that have covered you in crap. And you got to get it off. You got to get cleaned up. Now, I, I don't know what your life is like. I don't know what you've been through. I, just, I only know my own crap. I don't know yours. But I can tell you, most of us like to skip the cleanup step and go right into what's next. And as a result, we never fully feel okay. You, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And there may be circumstances in your life that you're kind of pussyfooting around and it's, it's time for you to just clean it up and move on. And the only person who's going to know what those are or even if those are present is you. And I'm just here to give you the reminder. So you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And, and you're also going to have to show some solidarity, meaning you're going to have to be with some people. You have to get rid of some stuff and get with some folks. You're going to have to be around other people. Did you know, I've been spending probably the last 10, 12 weeks um, studying the, the clinical side of happiness. I wanted to know, is there any difference between the biblical approach to happiness and joy and the scientific clinical approach to happiness and joy? It turns out it's different language, but, but basically the same principles apply. And what's been fascinating for me is I've read probably 30 different books on the topic is, is that the number one way that you can actually defeat depression is by getting around people. It, it's with love. Of course, ironically, when we're depressed, what's the first thing we do? We run away. We run away. We go, oh man, everybody must hate me. I'm going to go down in the basement. If they call, I'm not going to answer my phone because they probably hate me. If they come to my door and they ring the doorbell, I'm not going to answer because they're probably just here to tell me how much they hate me. So instead, I'll hide in the dog kennel in case they break into my house because they hate me. <laughs> we just take these, these crazy, extravagant actions to, to further isolate ourselves, which only deepens our sense of isolation and loneliness and depression. And, and what we ought to do instead is just get around people that we love and people that love us. And if you don't have anybody that you think loves you, and if you don't have anybody that you love... You can hang out with me. <laughs> I guarantee you, I don't like you. No, I'm kidding. 
No, the, the, the truth is you got to just start by getting around somebody, people you work with, people you know, family, if you, if you can stomach them. You, you, you got to just start by getting around people. And, and that's what I think is so crucial here is all of the actions that are taken among the Hebrew people are, are family actions. Not just immediate family, but, but ethnic family, spiritual family. It's, it's their church, for lack of a... Yeah, high five, good preaching. Yeah, it's their church. All right. So our desire is to be free. And if we're going to experience that kind of freedom, like them, we've got to take action. The action of sacrifice and solidarity. But, but like the ancient Israeli people, we also have to be aware of the fact that there's going to be some resistance, right? Metaphorically, Pharaoh is still coming for you. Your old life is still coming for you. That, that dirty boyfriend who used to talk trash, he's still going to be texting you, right? That, that, that old set of friendships that used to drag you down, they're coming back. And you've you got to just be aware of the fact that, th- that those booby traps are out there. That even though you've won the first victory or maybe even the first set of victories, that, that doesn't mean that the fight is over. That's why alcoholics still don't go to bars. I mean, if they've been sober for 20 or 30 years, they still don't go back and sit at the bar and have a cup of coffee because they know it's not a safe place for them. And so what we've got to do is, is be shrewd and wise and, and kind of set up the appropriate defenses for us. Are, are you okay out there? You all right? You look so serious. I mean, I, I think I'm really funny, but you guys look depressed, but you know. Hey, get around people. What a good... Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to do this again because I almost killed myself. But earlier today, I repeated an illustration from my childhood where I was dating a girl that I probably shouldn't have been dating. I thought she was great, but nobody else did. And so my friend Adam says to me, stand up on this stool. And I stood up on the stool and Adam said, here's why you shouldn't be dating this girl. He said, grab my hand. I said, okay. He said, now try and pull me up. And of course I couldn't. And he said, now I'm going to pull you down. And of course I fell bum over tea kettle right into his face. And the whole idea, of course, is that, is that there are relationships, there are people around you that, that you simply cannot elevate. No matter how much you try, no matter how hard you're working at it, they're, they're just going to drag you down. Anyway, at the 10 o'clock service, I got on this stool and almost lost my life and then couldn't figure out how to get off of it. Yeah, oh, it was so bad. I had people running up to catch me like this, like as... This little Filipino lady, she weighs 63 pounds, like she was going to be able... I mean, this is a lot of hamburger, right? That poor lady was going to get smeared. Anyway, you just enjoy that mental image for yourself. But, but the, point, the point is that there, there are people and circumstances and situations... Situations. There's no SH at the beginning of that word. There's stuff. That's going to come after you. And you've got to make sure that you keep running from it and that you get free from it. And then last but not least, that our desire is to be free. Our action is to make sacrifices, to be in solidarity with other people. We know to anticipate resistance and to watch out for it. And then the kick, the, the transition into our, the next chapter of our lives is to recognize that once you're on the far side of it, once you've gone through the Red Sea, so to speak, that doesn't mean your adventure is over. The Israelites escaped Pharaoh and his army. They were free of their captivity. But what were they supposed to do next? Well, God had promised them a new place to live. And so they marched to that new place. And then when they got there, they chickened out. And they didn't move in. They didn't set up camp. They had forgotten that the very God who brought them this far would be with them all the way home. And I think you and I do that a lot of times too. You know, we have victory in one area of our lives. Oh, great, I've, I've reconciled my relationship with my husband. Fantastic. And then we forget that the same mechanism by which we were able to fix one problem, the mechanism of faithfulness and obedience to God, of trusting that God has not abandoned us, of, of drawing deeply on the power of His Holy Spirit, we forget those are the same things we need to go forward into the future. That the same way you fix your job is the same way you fix your marriage, is the same way that you fix your work ethic, is the same way that you keep developing yourself as a person. And it's not some little set of steps. It's just by opening your heart up to God and saying, okay, I need your help. I'm going to listen to what you say. Let's go. And and that's the kicker, man. Don't, Don't forget what you've learned. Don't forget all that you've become. Don't forget all that God has done in you just because that one little problem is gone. Just because that one little adventure is over because you're going to have another one and another one, and another one, and another one. And there's no point you learning the same lessons all over again. 
Otherwise, your life just feels like a wheel, like you're spinning around in circles decade after decade after decade. Now, again, I told you that this is, I think, one of the big stories in the Bible and one of the big stories for Christians because it always seems to fit. If you're trying to change, if you're trying to get free of something, if you're aggressively pursuing some kind of development, this is always a story that speaks to us. It's always a story that works, reminding us that, that when our desires line up with God's desires, when we want to be free and live the life God is destined for us, that, that, then we're going to need to take action. It won't be easy. There'll be resistance. But if we hang on to him, if we're faithful, if we're wise, then we get to go on to the next adventure and so on and so forth. Let me pray for us and then, then we'll go ahead and worship God with our giving. Lord, thanks for everybody here. Thanks for the privilege of being their pastor, of us all hanging out and, and, and devoting ourselves to you. And we recognize, Lord, that, that none of us are perfect. None of us are especially good. We're, we're all here as broken and used cars. We need your help. We need your grace. We need the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit j just to make it through this week. And, and, and we want more than that. We don't want to just make it. We, we want to escalate. We want to get better. We want to get healthier and, and happier and experience all that you've promised. But, but we need you to do that. So we ask, Lord, that you'd make us increasingly aware of the power of your Spirit that we'd know when you're, when you're building up our muscles. We'd know when you're strengthening us. We'd know when you're leading us into something better. And, and we'd cooperate with you, not fight you, but, but work with you. And we thank you, God, that that's what you're doing all the time. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to worship God with our giving this morning. And that's what it looks like when a honey badger eats a cobra. Wow. Eats a cobra? Yeah, actually, honey badgers fight off like everything. Honey badgers? Honey badgers. Is that why oh, they talk hey. about them on that? Welcome back. <laughs> Hi everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> We're just discussing honey badgers. Mm -hmm. No relevance. Is a honey badger a real thing? It's a real animal and actually did you know baby cheetahs have this black and white stripe that goes down their back that resembles a honey badger so that they can fend off um, so that they get mistaken, intentionally get mistaken for a honey badger because honey badgers are so vicious. And so wow. get mistaken by honey badger and then the prey or, or the predator will just... How many times are we going to say honey badger? Honey badger. Honey, honey badger, badger. Honey badger. Badger, badger. badger. That's amazing. Guys, that was a great message uh, from Dave. And, you know, what we're going to talk about now is offering, monies, giving. We here at West Winds uh, believe wholeheartedly that uh, a big part of how we participate as a community is we pool resources to A, we can help those that are in need, B, we can build the church, right? We believe the church is the hope of the world. God works through the church to bless um, Christians and to bless the community at large. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited about the way that West Winds does that, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the Sunday morning service and uh, the uh, ministries that we partner with, you know, here locally and also internationally. Um, and if you guys, you know, want to, like, uh, check out um, what all our money is spent on here. That information is available, you know, to anybody that asks. And uh, I love uh, just how faithful uh, Westwinds and the leadership of Westwinds is to, um, you know, to give to those who are in need. Yeah. And to, uh, and to help those and, and to really um, build our church and heal the world and shadow God. So if you guys want to be involved, go to westwinds.org slash giving. And uh, you can give a one-time gift. You can set up recurring gifts. Uh, it's super easy. And uh, we'd, we'd love for you guys to partner with us in that way uh, and to do it with a spirit of uh, joy uh, in your heart. If you're able to do that, then go ahead. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, one other great thing about Westwinds yeah. is every Monday we have the Westwinds chat. It's on Facebook. Check it out every Monday at 8.30, Westwinds chat. Courtney White hosts it, hostesses it. A hostess. <laughs> now she now hosts I'm hungry it. for confectioned <laughs> sugary things. She uh, hostesses. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good platform, too. It is raining. And my windows are down. What? So, Get out of here. Fix your windows. Guys, window Facebook, down. you got to search, search West Winds Chat, and there'll be a group that you can join, uh, and then you can participate with us. Um, not just on Monday nights, throughout the week, you can see what's been talked about. Yeah. Just like anything on Facebook, like if someone posts a picture and there's a flurry of like comments and people chatting back and forth, but you can always come back later 
and uh, and comment on things as well and keep it, keep the discussion going throughout the week. There's constant so. prayer requests too. Yeah. she always ends it yep. with asking people if they have any prayer requests yeah. that's going on, and it's very. It's a closed forum too. It's a closed group, so you don't have to worry about you know your outside friends or whatever yep. seeing what you post in there. So mm -hmm. feel free to you know be as open as you as you need or feel that you should be. So yeah, it's beautiful. It's a community of people here at Westwinds that you know love and care for one another, and we you know uh, pray for each other and for what's sure. going on in our lives. So it's a great next step for if you're wanting to get more involved in a community yeah. of believers for and sure. uh, see what that's about. Speaking of which, if you guys have any prayer requests for us, don't. Um, hesitate to send them in. Check it out, Facebook. Yeah. Hashtag Westwinds. You can send a message directly to Westwinds, uh, Westwinds Community Church on Facebook. Uh, yeah. We love you guys. Thank you to our crew, Tyler and Troy, <laughs> keeping the lights on, <laughs> getting all the good we stuff going on. on. Yeah, we didn't turn it on okay. air, but we're on the well, air. Well, we hope you guys have a good week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.